All right, good uh, morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. Welcome to this uh, ILO research webinar, civil rights question of our time, time, how companies use AI to hire, survey, and fire workers, and what organized, organized labor can do to fight back. Um, I'm Eckhard Ernst, I'm the host, your host today, uh, and it's my pleasure to uh, introduce you to uh, Hilke Schellmann, who is uh, with us today to talk us uh, about or tell us more about her latest uh, publication, her latest book, um, and give us a chance to react to, to a very interesting uh, questions, discussions that we have um, around uh, AI at the workplace. So before I give you the floor, Hilke, just let me introduce you properly. Um, so Hilke Schellmann is an Emmy award winning investigative reporter and assistant professor of journalism at New York University. Uh, as a contributor to the Wall Street Journal and The Guardian, Hilke writes about holding artificial intelligence accountable. In her book, which we will uh, present today, uh, the algorithm of how AI decides who gets hired, monitored, promoted, and fired, and why, and why we need to fight back, she investigates the rise of AI in the world of work. Um, drawing on exclusive information from whistleblowers, internal documents, and real work tests, the Hilke discovers that many of the algorithms making high stakes decisions are biased racist and do more harm than good. Her four-part investigative podcast and uh, print series on AI and hiring for the MIT Technology Review was finalist for a Webby Award, uh, just for uh, background. And uh, as a former director of video journalism at Columbia University's Graduate School of Journalism, Hilke also spearheaded video coverage. As a multimedia reporter for the New York section of the Wall Street Journal, her work has appeared in several publications, including the New York Times, Vice, HBO, PBS, Time, ARD, ZDF, WNYC, National Geographic, The Guardian, Glamour, and The Atlantic. With that introduction, Helke, very welcome to the ILO to us, and uh, we are very much looking forward to, uh, to your presentation, and then we open up the floor for Q&A uh, to our audience. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. thank you for having me. So I'm, I'm so delighted by, by all this interest, um, and I'm really looking forward to this because, you know, my book is sort of how about how um, AI and algorithms are, are moving into the world of hiring and actually have taken over a large part of the hiring already, um, how they monitor workers, um, um, and also how we now starting to see signals that some companies use signals of AI tools as part of the decision making for uh, uh, layoffs or, or, or firings. Um, so I think we're seeing, uh, you know, I've looked at this world the last six years. Um, so what I wanted to do is like give a little bit of a just a brief background on where I see AI and, and other algorithmic tools moving into the space. So if we are all on sort of the same page, what is happening? And then um, I have some thoughts on like, what maybe organized labor uh, can do to put pressure on politicians, but also um, maybe work with companies or push against companies to reveal some of these uh, tools that are being used. Um, because I think organized labor is sort of a, uh, hopefully a good counterbalance to what we see sometimes in in the workplace. Um, so I, I got to this story, uh, maybe maybe in like a, a really uh, unusual way, because I took a lift ride at a conference in Washington, D.C. that was with lawyers, had nothing to do with AI in 2017. I took a lift ride to the train station to go back to New York, and I talked to the lift driver and just asked him, like, how was your day? And he was like, you know what, I really had a weird day. And I was like, really, what? And so he told me that he was interviewed by um, a robot, that a robot had called him and asked him three questions for a baggage handler position. And I didn't know, I had never heard, I was like, what, robot interviews? Um, so I got really interested, went to a bunch of conferences, found out that there is um, a vast use of, of AI already in hiring. And as I started to dig deeper, some of it is actually uh, causing more harm than good. And I can say that pretty authoritatively, because I think I talked to almost everyone in the, in in the space. And we talked about this, you know, I think this is like a civil rights question. I would push this this far because, you know, we, um, there's been so much progress on civil rights issues like fair employment screening, fair housing laws, like people have fought for these rights for a decade. And I would argue that some of these um, rights are now being undermined by these tools um, because there is no transparency. You know, it's really hard for, for folks to, to fight back because we often don't, maybe don't even know 
that AI is being used on us, right? So I've talked to uh, many job applicants who had to do one-way video interviews and one of the big companies in the space is HireVue. Um, and they all told me, so one-way video interviews work. There's no other person on the other side. You get some pre-recorded questions on your phone or on your desktop computer. You answer them by yourself. You basically record yourself. And they all thought that a human hiring man manager is watching all these videos which may be true, may be true, but um, it may also um, be true that an AI tool is um, uh, uh, looking at uh, the video and sort of scoring applicants on how likely they are to succeed in the job and rank them, right? It's all about the rankings because we see that companies want to have a technological solution because some of the companies, especially large ones, they get 3 million or so applications a year. They want some technology. So let me walk you through some of the technologies and what I found out about them in like very broad strokes. So we see um, AI and hiring used in job platforms. Um, so if anyone ever, uh, you know, sent out the last recently a job application through LinkedIn or other means, um, all these job platforms use some form of AI. We also see a lot of companies use applicant tracking systems, um, you know, that used to be, I think, sort of glorified Excel sheets, just sort of understand previously, like, okay, where in the different rounds of hiring is a candidate, what has been done, and, uh, you know, maybe have notes on people. All of these, you know, there are large vendors, Workday, Oracle, and others that, that offer some of these tools, and they all now have AI built in. We don't know a whole lot if companies turn that then on, right? Like it's all built in, but I don't know if company X has turned this AI on, this other AI. So we, we don't know a whole lot about it. Um, but what I've, I have found in, in regards to resume screeners, that's usually what the uh, resume screeners and parsers, what I found is when I talk to employment lawyers and employment lawyer adjacent folks who maybe come in when a vendor uh, is you know, trying to work with a company and a large company, uh, some of them do do their due diligence and bring in outside counsel often and maybe industrial organization psychologists to look at these. And what uh, folks I've spoken to found in resume screeners, um, uh, one of them had learned that the word uh, Thomas or the name Thomas is predictive of success. Uh, others things that they found is Syria and Canada. If you had those words on your resume, you were predicted to be more successful, um, which in the context of the United States and probably most Western countries would be um, maybe considered discrimination based on national origin. Um, we've also found um, uh, somebody found uh, basketball, football, and other hobbies as uh, predictors of success. Um, and in one case, uh, one of the employment lawyers actually found that the word African, like African-American or Africa was a predictor of, of um, uh, either su success or unsuccessfulness. So, you know, he was very, he was very clear, like this is like racial discrimination. Um, we found, he also found a tool that had given folks who had the word baseball on their resume, more points, and the word softball on their resume, fewer points. And in the U US context, that probably means that, you know, more men play and watch baseball that may have put that on their resume as a hobby, whereas women uh, traditionally play softball. So, you know, you have these, like, um, we see this again and again, what we call um, bias proxy variables um, that come in that look kind of neutral, like, what does baseball have to do with anything? But actually, um, they may bring in gender discrimination or, you know, sometimes if you look at one other early resume screener tool predicted that people playing lacrosse in high school was a predictor of success in a job. The job had nothing to do with lacrosse. It was just a regular job. Um, and I think that often tells us more about the socioeconomic background about applicants versus actually their experience, their skills, right? So I think what we see a lot is if we do a big data approach and take everything in, the tool is just built on uh, finding statistical significant uh, things. So maybe there were a bunch of Thomases in the training data on the pile, or maybe people who like baseball. And so we have this kind of discrimination come in through the back door. Um, and I think what also people maybe don't realize, a lot of these tools are trained on current employees. So the tool would get maybe resumes of people who have been hired the last two years or have had a job interview the past two years. And um, the, the tool looks through all of the resumes and looks at statistically significant significant keywords. Um, unfortunately, it can take on any keywords. Um, and I think it might also reflect uh, prior uh, gender disparities. For example, like Amazon had a resume screener that uh, was was built on resumes from people who were who were already at the tech company, and they had 
historically higher at more men than women. So the tool learned over time that uh, folks who had the word woman or women, I don't know, like women's basketball team or women's chess team on their resume um, were, were downgraded. Um, Amazon tried to fix the problem, couldn't, and abandoned the tool. But that might tell us that you know some of these tools maybe are maybe are not fixable. Um, so that's sort of early on in the in the in the hiring funnel. Uh, then I talked already a little bit what often happens: companies may use one-way video interviews, um, uh, where uh, you just record yourself answering. And what we've seen there is in the past companies and still some companies use facial expression analysis. Um, it's the same thing. The tool is often trained. Some of them are off the shelf, but some of them are trained on uh, previous job interviews of candidates and use like their facial expressions and sort of compare then my facial expressions or of candidates, like what facial expressions and tone of voice and words that they use uh, uh, to answer the same question. And if you compare if you're very similar to the group um, who already was hired, you're probably going to be routed on the yes pile. If you're not, you're going into the no pile. And obviously, um, as I and other reporters and others have pointed out, there's no science underneath facial expression analysis for, for jobs, right? We don't know what facial expressions you need for any given job. We certainly don't know what facial expressions we need in a job interview to predict job success. Um, and then also, you know, this effect of computing um, uh, technology is really good at understanding, like, are my um, mouth, uh, is my mouth raised and am I smiling? But it uh, it often infers happiness and other basic emotions. And that's also um, debunked by um, psychologists who say there is a variability in here. And this doesn't actually um, I mean that everyone is feeling the same things. And why are we using this kind of flawed technology? Um, I think what I've often heard from folks in the space is we're using technology because we have ways to track signals. Do they get us meaningful results? That is sort of the, the second question here. But I think uh, companies just really want to use some of these tools. Um, we've heard um, about gamified assessments. And I think there's a really big concern here. These are sort of video games. Pre-Pac-Man, the aesthetic is very bare bones that people play and people in the job also previously play it and whatever they have in common versus the general population, candidates are being checked against. So for example, if you have 50 accountants that play the game, maybe all your accountants are really uh, risk takers in video games. So then if I'm, you know, you have to pump up a balloon, that's one of the first games. And, you know, it's sort of is, uh, uh, allegedly predicting how much of a risk taker I am. So maybe, um, and the, you know, there's a couple of uh, questions around that. Maybe I'm a daredevil risk taker in video games, but not in real life. Um, so this is actually checking real life behavior is a question, uh, but also does actually risk um, uh, um, propensity of risk taking actually have anything to do with the job? It might just be that your 50 accountants are all risk takers, who knows why, uh, but is that actually a trade or a skill that you need for the job? So there's a lot of questions. And what really struck me a lot with the games, but also the one-way video interviews and a lot of these AI screens, um, it's really questionable how they work for some folks with disabilities. Um, and I think that should concern us all. So we, um, uh, I played one of the games with somebody who has a disability and he was really struck by one of the things, one of the parts in the game, you have to hit this space bar as fast as possible. Um, and he was really uh, concerned for folks who have like a motor disability or something like that, that actually couldn't hit the space, space bar as fast as possible, might get rejected. Um, and they may be able to do the job with reasonable accommodation, which is the law under the American with Disabilities Act. Um, I think that's a problem. Another problem I actually found out adjacent to uh, disabilities is um, that, um, uh, you know, that we see a lot of, like in the United States, applicants are allowed to have a reasonable accommodation. Um, so they can deny, say like, I don't want to do this assessment. Uh, I want to have a, uh, I want to have an accommodation. So I talked to a bunch of vocational counselors who said, yes, we asked for accommodations and another way of being, uh, uh, of, of being hired. Um, and we never heard back from the company. So it seems like the legal way is already kind of broken that companies have to legally offer. Um, and I think that's also very concerning. Um, and you know, the, the question of disabilities is not only hitting the space bar, but in general, like people with disabilities are underrepresented in the workforce. So if we have training data, they're not going to be represented in, in it or 
very few people will be represented in it. And then disabilities are often expressed very individually. So I'm, you know, if somebody who has autism plays a game and maybe their data gets captured, but the next person who has autism, um, their disability might express itself very differently. So it wouldn't be captured. Um, and there's also a question about these tools that look in general through statistical uh, significant data would ever find people who are sort of already on the margins. Um, uh, you know, we might all just look for their statistical uh, uh, medium and, and that might actually exclude people who have been underrepresented in, in the workforce. Um, and I've also found out that some of the gamified assessments actually uh, in pilot studies uh, discriminated against um, uh, women and the, the company couldn't fix it. Um, and the company didn't go with the vendor, but the vendor is still around. So I think that also speaks to, I think probably some of the frustrations of maybe labor organizers as well. It's like, we, we just don't know. Companies might try these tools, they might abandon them um, because they don't work, but nobody's ever the wiser because it's not public knowledge and the vendors are not being pressured to change their technologies. Um, and then I wanted to move into, that's some of the, you know, the biggest problems I've sort of uncovered in hiring but also we see a lot of AI now being used at work. So we see, um, you know, obviously like keystrokes uh, uh, recording, people re uh, are being um, asked to um, take their image every day they check in or every minute or so their, their webcam is taking an image of them. Uh, we also see um, uh, people analytics, um, there's like threat assessments, you know, is there an insider risk um, and some companies, um, now I think assume that every, there's a, there's a, uh, they want to do a zero risk. So every employee is potentially a threat, um, to leak data or to undermine the system. We see in people analytics, um, uh, you know, some, uh, mathematical AI tools that calculate flight risk. Um, and we see, um, this was from a recent CNBC um, article that large employers, including Walmart, Delta Airlines, Chevron, Starbucks, and European companies like Nestle and AstraZeneca uh, use um, AI to check employee slacks, email, Zoom teams, they check for employee sentiment uh, um, and infractions. So they say the tool can identify bullying, harassment, discrimination, non-compliance, pornography, nudity, and other behaviors. Um, and the company says that, uh, you know, managers in the company will only see a, a, a aggregate um, take on like whole teams or something. But if there is a threat generated, of course, the company will know the clear name of the employer employee and can send that to uh, to legal and HR for further investigations. Um, I've also seen and I think that's sort of pushing it a little bit maybe into the into the the future a little bit is that we also see um you know sort of health assessments coming into work and I think there's going to be a lot of clash with privacy um ideas that like um you know if I um uh, if if I you know it started with like sort of uh, checking how many uh, steps do you take a day, um, but I think um, sort of the problem is we see some of these tools. This was used in a university in the U.S., not in the workplace, but they used a tool called the vocal biomarker that out of the speech stream of me speaking, a tool can assess if I'm depressed or anxious. Um, and um, there's no safeguards around this. So I downloaded the tool myself. You can. There's an American insurance company that offers that. And I checked it on random YouTube uh, uh, folks um, if they're anxious or depressed. So anyone could use these kinds of tools that are pushing into the market. And um, I think there is like, you know, real threats to people who maybe have a disability and don't want their employer to know that this will be revealed because they just can't do 10,000 steps a day um, on a very basic level. But, you know, it might also reveal from the way I speak, how anxious or depressed I am. Um, you know, maybe I put something in a Slack message to my um, uh, to my colleague um, and, uh, you know, the company finds out through some of these um, AI sentiment analyses. Um, and, you know, I know that other countries have, have different laws in the United States, case law, you know, there's no whole lot of protections for workers, uh, especially on companies' computers. So the general case law that we've seen is that anything that happens on the company computer belongs to the company, um, and they can check any of these uh, uh, things as they wish. Um, 
I think we've seen a little bit of pushback from an interesting agency, the National Labor Relations Board in the United States, where uh, um, uh, they have publicly come out and said like, hey, 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 uh, some of this like broad monitoring may be problematic because people in the United States workers are allowed to um, uh, you know, start union activities, form a union, and this kind of uh, union activity is protected. Um, and it might may, may rise up in some of this sentiment analysis where you just analyze everything. Um, but again, we don't know a whole lot of here because no one has to register that they're doing this, right? And there isn't a whole lot of transparency. We just know some of the effects because I go to these like HR tech conferences and vendors like happily share what they do. Um, and um, I think another part of um, uh, health tech coming into the space is one company that I profiled um, that looks at um, employees' healthcare data or benefits data um, to sort of um, personalize uh, health benefits. So the way they explained it is like, so they talked to me about a synthetic person called Aiden. Um, and, you know, Aiden is, you know, an employee at some company and uh, they find out, oh, Aiden dropped their, their spouse from the medical plan because most of the time in the U.S. you get health insurance through your employer. Um, they're probably going through a divorce. That was the inference of the AI tool. Um, and the AI tool was going to suggest a therapist um, through like the company's benefits, the medical benefits that you have. They also found out that uh, uh, Aiden withdrew money from their retirement account, uh, and maybe they need a financial advisor. Um, they also talked about another synthetic person. I don't remember her name, but she had back surgery. Uh, so they suggested physical therapy to her. And I was really struck and I was like, well, how did you know that this person had back surgery? Isn't that private? Like, um, and they kept saying that they have access to medical claims, that they have data on hundred million Americans that they buy on the open market. Um, so some of it is, I think, uh, inferences, right. Based on, uh, groups that we sort of see in marketing. So, you know, you're over 50, you sit at your desk all day, maybe you should do physical therapy or move around. Um, those are kind of prediction predictions based on group, but we also see that actually some of these companies have access to our very private, um, benefit data that I have to share with my employer if I want healthcare in the United States. I, I cannot opt out of that. Um, so I wasn't aware that companies uh, can, can trade that information. And we in the United States often think we have HIPAA, which is uh, actually a patient doctor privacy law, but it actually doesn't uh, um, have anything to do with third parties. Um, so I think we'll, we'll see a lot more here of those kinds of tools uh, push, push into the market that I think could be um, problematic for privacy of employees and sort of our data coming out and our health issues being made uh, public. Um, and, and the last thing I wanted to, to mention is that we're now seeing um, that uh, AI tools are being used um, to make firing or layoff decisions. Like they're often used as one signal of many. Um, we don't have a lot of information here, but we know that some companies, um, you know, and I think warehouse workers are often the, um, unfortunately, the canaries in the coal mine, the people that have uh, one one of the least powers in, in, in the workplace, um, that, you know, there's like algorithmic uh, productivity rankings. And if you fall below it so many times, you will get um, uh, laid off. We see this for... Um, uh, uh, you know, uh, drivers, private drivers who work for large companies to drive on packages, um, you know, they get satisfactory ratings if they don't deliver all the packages, all that gets tracked. And, you know, the companies say there is a human looking over this, but, you know, clearly if you fall under your satisfactory rating so many times, the company will uh, fire you. And we've seen some weird applications of video interviews for hiring, for layoffs, in the UK, um, hopefully that was just one little case that I found, but uh, we've seen like wild applications in this space. Um, so we see AI um, uh, everywhere uh, in, in companies. And I think for monitoring, we don't have official data, but the New York Times found out eight out of the 10 largest employers in the US use monitoring on their employers employees. And um, in hiring, we know that most Fortune 500 companies use AI tools in their hiring funnel somewhere. We know that job platforms use it. So it's pretty pretty widespread. And I think applicants and I think um, a lot of workers don't actually know that. Um, and 
I sometimes talk about this, like we are sort of forced consumers of this technology, right? Because if I'm a job applicant and if I want the job, I kind of have to um, uh, say yes, right? If a company sends me a video interview, am I going to say no if I want the job? The same thing on my first day at work, if, you know, some companies will give you some sort of like, oh, here's your access to our um, I don't know, uh, Google Drive, uh, just so you know, we monitor, you know, we might, this might be monitored and you have to click yes. And you have to agree to that. I think people just feel like, well, I have to agree, agree to that. What's going to happen is my first day at the, at the new job. I don't want to get fired. So there may be some disclosure, but I think it's sort of, uh, a little bit, maybe a uh, forced consent. Um, and, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it at that. Um, uh, and I think one, problem is often as soon as companies have these data points, um, it's really hard to not use them for other decision making. So I talked to an analyst who shared that a company had used key swipe data. So how often are you at your desk? How often, how long are you at work um, for promotions, which is already a flawed um, variable as anyone can understand that like you can just sit at your desk at 10 hours. I don't know if you're really productive, but when it was time to do layoffs during the pandemic, the company also wanted to look at the data and check if people had long times of absenteeism um, that, that maybe they would be fired because, you know, they're lazy or, you know, whatever um, idea people had not taking into account that people maybe have caregiving giving obligations that they may be sick, you know, you know, whatever uh, may happen to folks. Uh, and I think that's sort of uh, a, another threat that we see. Um, I leave it at that. I'll have some ideas what labor unions can do um, or organize labor. Um, but I also wanted to make sure we have time for questions and a uh, discussion. Excellent. Super, super fascinating, super frightening too, I have to say. Uh, I see already some hands up. Before I give uh, uh, all folks the floor, just one question I would have is, are we already seeing some um, some pushback in, in, the, uh, in terms of technology to try to um, um, distort maybe your images and your voices? I, one, one example that comes to my mind is that in, in China, apparently, where the social credit scoring has been, has been used, they are also using uh, tools to kind of try to get around it. And I was wondering whether you know of some of these tools as yes. well in the US. Um, I, I don't know how, how sophisticated they are, but we've seen, um, uh, and I think companies are also aware of it, it's called like productivity theater. So you maybe know that you're being uh, checked um, as an employee. And so um, employees aren't dumb, right? They, they understand that. And so we see a lot of tools, like there's mouse jigglers to make sure that your mouth is always moving. So the green active is always on, right? That it doesn't look like you stepped away from your desk. Um, now monitoring companies that I have used to track myself emailed me that they know how they can uh, now find mouse jigglers. But there's all kinds of ways, right? There's also just human ways. Like people check in early in the morning on Slack, right? I'm ready to work. And then they take the dog for a walk. Um, <laughs> so we see like a lot of product activity theater. Um, and I think, um, you know, and we also seen in the research that uh, productivity monitoring is actually not leading to more monitoring. It's leading to more productivity theater um, mm -hmm. where uh, employees just go to, um, uh, you know, Zoom meetings to show their face, um, but it's actually not part of their job. They just want to tell everyone like, hey, I'm here. Mm -hmm. So we lose a lot of time at work for unproductive things. Um, I'm always baffled that that companies would be interested in that. Um, uh, but that's that's sort of uh, part of the thing like there's genius ways of humans to like undermine these tools but I don't think we see that on a grand scale okay um, so it might be individual workers who find yeah. ways to sort of uh, jiggle their mouse um, fascinating all right I see Marcella was the first one to have uh, hands up uh, um, Alessandro can we give uh, the floor to our um, speaker to our guests yeah absolutely please go ahead Okay, Marcella, just unmute yourself and ask your question. Or otherwise put it in the chat if you if you're unable to, to speak right now. I I suggest you put your question in the chat. I, I don't know, we, we don't seem to be able to hear you. Um oh now here. I can also uh, answer one of the questions already in the chat while Marcella is typing, would AI be able to detect a deep fake? So uh, at least in hiring, I tried that out myself. Uh, some of the video interviews, I wasn't actually in front of the camera. I was next to the camera, so there was no human. And I typed my questions out and had a deep fake uh, generate uh, my voice. And the computer still gave me like an 80% or something. Um, 
uh, um, match score for the job. So no, a lot of companies don't have any detections for deep fakes. And I think actually the FBI is issued a security threat to companies a few months ago saying exactly like this, like you, um, you are not checking enough for people maybe who are uh, swapping out people to take assessments for them. Uh, you know, maybe I'm not a good computer scientist or computer engineer. I'll get somebody who can do it, take the assessments for me. And then I show up on day one. Uh, but also like kind of deep fakes and in, in job interviews, there's not, there, there's nothing that, um, not much that companies have built in. Maybe they've, um, so I think that that worries some companies as well. All right. There's another question here that, uh, in the Q&A. So are these AI-based tools more biased than a human HR officer? So I think that the, the question is out of that. We, we don't have really uh, lots of research um, on that. We know that humans are incredibly biased, right? We know that we have unconscious bias, that we think we are super fair, but we are actually not. Uh, we also make decisions based if we are hungry or had a good night's sleep or not. We might like people better when we chit chat with them in job interviews, right? Um, uh, so these are, these are problematic things that humans do. I sort of feel like um, you know, there's only so much harm a human hiring manager can do. They can only hire so many people. And that if they don't like women, if they don't hire women, that sucks. And I'm sorry to these to these women that it happened to them. But the scope of some of these AI tools are just unprecedented. So if you imagine that you have, uh, uh, you know, if you're a big company that has 3 million applications and you have a faulty algorithm that throws out all people that have the word woman or women on their resume, um, you may um, discriminate against tens of thousands, maybe even hundreds of thousands of people. So a human hiring manager could never do that. Um, so I think that's sort of the uh, the threat that if these tools are not monitored and not supervised, the scope is just unprecedented. So Marcella, I uh, managed to put her question in the chat. So is there, uh, she, she wanted to know, is there any global ethic code or is, this only, uh, uh, is there only country law that kind of apply to these things? Um, I mean, I think, you know, we're all working on uh, sort of uh, uh, global ethics uh, codes, but I don't, you know, there, to my knowledge, there is like uh, sort of um, uh, hopes that people do more explainable AI, use, um, uh, you know, um, uh, use transparency in, in AI codes, but we actually um, haven't seen any binding agreements um, on, on that. So we have country laws, but we all know that like technology is like much, much faster than the law will ever catch up. Um, and, you know, I think there's also a lack of knowledge for, uh, regulators. Like we've seen, there's actually, uh, an AI and hiring law that was passed in, in New York city a while ago. It's now in, in, um, it's actually the law and we see very few compliance. Like we, um, Companies that use AI tools in hiring in, in New York need to have an annual audit. We've seen 18 companies comply with the audit. Um, and we know that thousands of companies hire in New York, and I'm sure a lot of them use AI, but there's kind of loopholes in the law. Um, so I think we also, I, I'm not, I, I think the, 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 the law was poorly crafted. Um, so I think even when we have regulations, I think we're not often quite sure how to regulate some of these tools. All right, uh, Damien, I had a question on, are there any attempts to legally regulate the employer's resort to use to the use of AI tools in hiring, firing, or other employment relations? I mean, you have just given an example. Any good practices apart from the US National Labor Relations Board, maybe some other countries that you're aware yeah, of? Yeah, I do, actually. I have some I have some thoughts. Like, I think what's... Um... Uh, what what might be really helpful is uh, uh, one system that we see um, in Germany and Austria. It's called Betriebsrat or Workers' Council. So that's like a little bit different than how uh, labor unions operate there uh, because they're usually more for whole branches. Um, but a Betriebsrat or Workers' Council is for every uh, company um, alone. I think sometimes it's even specific locations. Um, so um, the way the law works in Germany is as soon as a company has five or more employees, they can vote for a Betriebsrat. And there is actually a law that um, uh, mandates where the Betriebsrat or the Workers' Council can make decisions with the employers together. And what we see, there is uh, the uh, paragraph uh, 87.6 co-determination rights, where it says, the introduction and use of technical devices designed to monitor the behavior or performance of the employees is part of where uh, the workers' council gets to make a decision if these should be introduced. And what I've seen, I've talked to some um, uh, workers' council members in Germany and some employment lawyers, is that actually 
the Workers' Council were able to push back against individual um, uh, AI productivity rates, for example, and only allow employers to use this on, on, on an aggregate level. So I think if you can change national law and get like a Workers' Council, I think that would be really helpful. Um, but I do think also what might be helpful is like if um, a union is uh, negotiating a new contract, um, I think what might be helpful is like ask for disclosure of some of these tools and maybe even that unions have to uh, 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 maybe ask their members if they agree to these tools or the union gets to uh, decide if some of these tools should should be used. So we would have disclosure and we would have participation in, in um, um, uh, decision making. And we've seen this a little bit like in the uh, so-called Hollywood strike that we've seen in the U.S., right, with actors and uh, screenwriters, and they have some uh, provisions about AI now in the tool. This is about generative AI writing screenplays, but I could also see that that uh, that um, labor unions could could negotiate what you know what I call predictive AI, right? How how are these predictions used on workers? That they need to be disclosure. It's not allowed to be used on individual workers. Um, it's not allowed to use in a punitive way. Like there they could be uh, measurements that that unions could negotiate um, and force uh, companies for for uh, to to disclose what 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 they're using. Actually, that ties in very nicely with one of the questions. I jump ahead a bit, uh, but there's uh, um, as a question: Could you say more about how you think organized labor can successfully address these issues to protect workers and jobs? Yeah. Um, so I think that 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 is kind of a way. I think what might also be helpful is to, um, and you know, I don't know about like capacity building, but is that you know there might be a way for unions to build tools that workers can sort of check. Uh, what is being downloaded on their computer, uh, like what inferences are being made, like, you know, like some of the the um, software that, that is installed leaves traces on the computer. So you could um, uh, um, uh, build that back. And I don't think we, um, and I don't know if it's really illegal for employees to uh, run um, something that, that checks if like their camera turns on and takes screenshots, right? So I think that might be a way um, to survey your, um, uh, you know, survey is one way uh, of finding out like, okay, what is happening to our employees, but also maybe build uh, some some very basic tools to understand, okay, what is happening on employees' computers? Um, and can we make inferences out of that? I understand that is a, like a sort of a higher level um, uh, 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 burden for, for unions, but, but that might be a way to also understand like how is the information uh, being used? Uh, actually, you had uh, um, you mentioned that very very briefly uh, early on, but there's a question, and I think which which we, would be interesting because of your you know your your cross uh, country kind of experiences. Like uh, one of the our guests, I wanted to see: Do you see big differences in in the EU, UK, and the US in terms of deployment, use, regulation, etc.? Um, a little bit. Uh, a little bit. So, I mean, the the the, Europe, the European Union is like a much more stronger regulator than the U.S. is, right? Like we often have um, uh, almost like do no harm first. Like you know, chemical companies have to prove that their compounds do no harm before they're allowed to enter the market. In some circumstances, in the European Union, the U.S. it's often uh, you you enter the market and then you get uh, uh, dissed if there's a problem and harm may have been done. But with these AI tools, like even in the European Union, a lot of them were deployed. We know that some of these AI tools were deployed in the UK. Some of them were deployed in uh, in Germany, much much less in Germany, uh, but but they were deployed there as well. Um, and there hasn't been a whole regulation until you know. I think some of the things that are helpful in the European context is what helped me as a reporter is the GDP GDPR, the General Data Protection. Uh, law, um, because I had some folks who were um, maybe journalism adjacent people who knew about disclosure laws and knew about GDPR. So I had one person who applied for, for a job at Bloomberg in London out of Barcelona, and he got rejected within 24 hours. He had to do a gamified assessment. And while he was doing the gamified assessment, he was like, why am I like sort of slotting in like different visual objects? Like, what does it have to do with scraping websites? Like, I'm a data analyst. Hey, I don't understand. So he he demanded his data, which he is allowed to do under GDPR, and he pushed. And um, uh, Bloomberg was actually reprimanded from the ICO. It's a it's an independent uh, uh, data body in 
in the UK um, and, and Bloomberg paid a settlement. But those are like individual cases, which I think might be helpful for unions to use on a bigger level. Like, can you force disclosure of some of the companies under the GDPR? Like, let's try that. You know, is it possible to ask for your data, how companies use it? Is that a legal way to get information? So I could see that. Like we see, um, obviously there is an AI law on the table in the European Union. Um, and I was really glad to see that um, hiring and uh, um, work monitor or AI in the world of work is actually uh, in the high stakes category because I think it has fallen under the radar often um, because we just don't know about it a lot. Um, and I think because applicants don't know about it, workers don't necessarily know about it, what is being used on them. Um, so it kind of always fell under the radar. We were worried about facial expression analysis, um, you know, social uh, uh, algorithms, and we should all be worried about all of those too, but I'm glad to see that hiring and work monitoring is in the high stakes category. So hopefully that means um, there will be more disclosure, there will be more regulation on that. Um, but so far the regulation that we've seen hasn't been really helpful to, to um, push out uh, tools that don't work and harm people unfortunately. Um, because I think what happens is like, it's just a black box, even to the vendors who built the tools, they often don't know exactly how these tools score people. Certainly the companies that use it don't know exactly, and applicants don't know it either. So what we've had before, and maybe in assessments in the past is like, for a firefighter job, you had to carry 200 pounds, and everyone knew that, right? Or this was the assessment, these are the questions that are being asked. And labor unions and, and job applicants could question that in court, right? Bring a loss and be like, do you really need to carry 200 pounds of equipment? Or is this a way to uh, um, hire fewer women because they can generally often carry less weight? Is this really necessary, right? You could challenge those things in court. Is it really necessary to have a high school uh, degree to uh, to go into uh, upper management was one question in the 70s uh, that was litigated in court. But actually now we don't know actually how we're being um, and, and inferred and uh, and uh, how AI is used on us. So we don't have that knowledge anymore and can fight it so easily. Uh, you taught, uh, uh, told us earlier about uh, uh, the, some of the German experiences. I think we have a follow-up question that would be in actually interesting. Maybe get a more specific, uh, some of the experience that you have uh, in terms of co-governance of algorithmic systems by employers and workers. I mean, can you tell us, maybe give us some examples of what you have observed there? Um. I can only tell you that it's one that is like very, very large companies. Oh, I can actually tell you one example. So one I had to tell, I had to promise them to not tell the company because they're afraid of uh, re, re, uh, retaliation because they do feel like, oh, we're just a few employees. So uh, these are generally really large uh, companies that have a lot of might in the marketplace. And it's kind of interesting to see how like a small Betriebsrat can, can push back against that under German law and the companies have to comply. Uh, another company that I spoke with is uh, Vodafone, um, which is a big uh, company usually in Europe and in the UK uh, for, for communication and mobile services. Um, and uh, they use an AI company called Eightfold that infers um, uh, people's skills based on the resume. Um, and, uh, you know, in, in the job application process can actually also uh, give people ideas like, oh, you have these skills on your resume, why don't you apply here? And when you go to the Vodafone page, um, and it's the same for work monitoring, is like you see uh, applicants everywhere in the world and Germany. Uh, and Germany doesn't have the AI tool because the Workers' Council voted against it. Um, uh, so they have a whole different system uh, for Germany alone. Maybe Austria is in there. I don't know that. But um, um, so you see, like, it has some changes. And, you know, my hope is, and, um, but I'm not sure that's going to happen. You know, what we sometimes see if there's a very regulated uh, country that has a lot of people, which the European Union, Union certainly has, that some companies will build a tool that will comply with these higher regulatory um, uh, requirements and then use the same tool because they're not going to build a tool for all different countries, uh, use that in other places. That is a hope. We see that sometimes with California and car makers in the United States. California has like often a higher regulatory burden. So they build cars that will pass in California and with that in other states. But these AI tools are often also calibrated per company. So the company doesn't operate in the European Union. I'm not sure it's helpful for other people um, in other jurisdictions. And I think, um, you know, we talk a lot about 
uh, Europe and, and the US, but a lot of these AI tools are also being used in India, I've uh, learned. Um, and I think there is um, less regulation there. And I think there's also a lot of fear of companies that folks um uh uh you know it's hard to certify degrees and and who the, who these who folks are who apply so i think there's actually a lot more gamified assessment and 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 things that are being used there um and we've seen you know i tested this tool that was supposedly finding um um call center employees in the global south for western companies and one of the requirements the AI tool was going to check if they speak english how well they speak english um so we see a lot of this and i think that's another thing that i found out that like yes we see some of these especially the hiring tools and monitoring is used on like sort of more white collar workers but in hiring it certainly started with hourly workers they call it high volume uh, uh, high turnover uh, jobs um, that, you know, are usually the people that have least the least power in the marketplace to push back, right? They, they're looking for hourly work in retail at like minimum or just slightly above minimum wage. Um, those are usually not folks that are organized or have the power to organize, a time to organize. Uh, we see this a lot in fast food um, uh, uh, jobs in the United States. So it's like moving up a little bit. It's, we saw some nursing, some teachers, um, flight attendants, Delta Airlines used uh, uh, one-way video interviews with AI at one point. Um, so, but uh, yeah, we see it usually on the folks that have the least power. I, I think you almost an answered already one of the other questions that we got, which yeah. was exactly on on you know the difference or diversion between developed and selected developing countries. I mean, you have any other examples that you can give other than India? You mentioned India. Um, I mean, I guess like some of the you know curious thing AI which I tested, which does the English inference is also used on folks in the Philippines and uh, uh, in other places that Western companies uh, or English speaking Western companies that have have to have customer service uh, folks uh, English speaking uh, outsource into other countries. Um, we see a lot of the stuff. Uh, some of the stuff being built in in Australia and then uh, sort of going into the Pacific Rim and 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 pushing into Asia, um, some of these tools being used. But we don't I, I don't know a whole lot about um, how how often it's used in, in other countries, because I think some of the other countries don't have like as strong disclosure laws in, as as the United States and not as much as organized labor or employment lawyers um, that I can easily access and sort of ask questions. One question that we got, and I mean, uh, allow me to rephrase it maybe slightly, is that um, uh, obviously these tools might have been different uh, advantages and costs for, for different people. I mean, you mentioned already high, high versus uh, low skilled workers. Uh, are there any attempts to maybe kind of, uh, you know, bring everybody on the same page or uh, allowing, you know, uh, other people as well to benefit from these tools, so those who typically are being on the disadvantage? Yeah, do you see any efforts in this in, in, in this area? Or is it is it is it really just I mean you mentioned at the beginning it's just a tool to to treat everybody as a possible threat? Um to bring everyone on the same page. So I mean I think it's like it, you know, we know so I get to uh check some of these companies and like watch their webinars and like what they usually give to other companies, right? This is like business to business uh uh marketing. They don't assume that reporters are gonna watch uh some of these boring webinars where they talk about how to how to com use use the software. So we see that a lot of tech companies have like a multitude of things you can turn off and on. Um so I don't necessarily know uh what is being turned on for others i just know that the that the software has the capability to uh basically monitor everyone and uh sort of bring up certain things like if you put um certain signals right like it can also look at outside signals like reviews of the companies it can check if you update your linkedin there's some companies that do mm. social media continuous social media background check of employees so it keeps checking um, what you post on social media, if you have any, uh, uh, you know, if you maybe have some ra racist comments, if you're a misogynist, if uh, it might also some some of that assessment might push into um, at least in the U.S. Uh, illegal places. For example, one co some companies say they can find out if you're prone to self harm. Uh, that that sounds like a medical condition um, or a mental health condition, and that is protected. Under the law, the companies are not allowed to ask for that before you have an offer, and they really are not supposed to monitor for that. So we have some of these pushbacks against each other, um, but but I don't know if it's um, uh, helping individuals. I mean, I, I hope that like 
folks see in general that, um, you know, it would be beneficial for everyone if we knew more about this and we could push back, uh, you know, uh, organized labor can push back on a more general level. But, you know, I'm not sure how much individual workers, uh, because you don't often feel the surveillance. I mean, I've talked to some who knew they were surveyed who get reports every day. If they step away for more than 15 minutes, one person is a medical coder. She put like a she put a timer on when she went to the bathroom and got a snack because she knew like if I do this more than 15 minutes, you know, I get a call immediately or an email from my boss. And she was quite scared, scared of that. And she said, yeah, we got like reports every day who was at the bottom uh, of rankings. And she felt like a lot of psychological distress. Um, mm. So I think those workers probably would be interested in uh, action together. But I hope that a lot of workers sort of see the threat scenario that even if they're monitored and um, uh, nothing comes up against that they understand, well, they, they could be easily, these kinds of signals can be easily misinterpreted. Um, so a signal could be that you put a USB stick in your in your computer and move files. Like that could be an insider risk assessment threat that puts you on some monitoring list by your company. Um, but, you know, who knows? Maybe you were just like uploading a presentation, uh, sure. right? Like it, we don't know what the insider threat is. So I think I hope that people would understand that this is a, a problem and could easily backfire on any worker for any kind of activity. I mean, I, I mean, so, sorry to come back to this question because I think it's actually an important point because from what you're describing is that most of the tools are currently used mostly to survey and monitor, not so much to assess maybe a more holistic picture of employees. And I mean, you mentioned Eightfold before. Um, some of these companies like Eightfold claim at least that they that they try to give a broader picture of the competencies a person has. And that would tie into that idea that, you know, you actually could benefit maybe from these tools because it doesn't only assess your formal uh, 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 you know, documented skills, but also some of the other skills that you might have assessed. But that doesn't seem to be the case from what you're describing. Uh, not always. I think um, Eightfold is one of the exceptions that I think you could actually get some information uh, back because I think it's like mutually beneficial, right? Like you upload your resume and your employer can also do some workforce planning and sort of understand what are the people in my enterprise that have this skills, who needs to be upskilled and who's close to be upskilled, mm -hmm. right? Like who knows this, I don't know, software language and they can learn the new ones pretty easily, um, you know, if we push into this next uh, thing. Um, and I think that could be really helpful. And it also gives people uh, feedback, like giving me people or people in your position have done X, Y, and Z to go to the next uh, level and 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 get promoted. Um, so I think that can be helpful. I think what all these companies need to have is sort of uh, maybe an appeal function um, or in function of like getting some of the data uh, back to you because I think you know I always wonder like what did ha happen to people who don't uh, uh, who just don't want to do eightfold and don't want to know anything about their career are they going to be labeled as people who don't upskill who are not agile right like what is with the people that don't want to walk ten thousand or maybe they walk ten thousand steps a day but they just don't want to have it in a company yeah. computer um, like what happens what happens to them and I think we see there isn't a whole lot of pushback from workers to some of these, um, you know, maybe health assessments coming into the workplace because they benefit from it, right? I get like m money off from my gym membership or something like that. And I feel better um, because it's tied into this idea of productivity that I think a lot of individuals, um, especially in the Western world are sort of obsessed with productivity and being more pro productive. And I think that feels like it's helping them, uh, but they don't see maybe the difference that like, yeah, if I track, you know, as a woman, if I track my period, that's, you know, on me and I want to make sure that I do it with an app that maybe doesn't uh, relay the data. But if a company starts tracking uh, their female employees' uh, periods, I mean, and sort of assesses like who's going to maybe have a kid and go on maternity leave and am I going to put them up for promotions? I think maybe people would see, oh, this is like a yeah. real threat, this kind of tracking um, and could fire backfire to anyone. Um, yeah. So I, yeah. I hope that would be helpful. One very uh, very important question here uh, by Raphael is: uh, Has there ever been a case where uh, employers were uh, were being held accountable for erroneous AI aided decisions? Not to my knowledge. Um, so everyone in the U.S. at least is waiting for one of those big lawsuits. I think the problem is the way the legal system in most countries is uh, structured. It makes it incredibly difficult because in the United States, like I, you know, 
lots of us have applied for jobs and we get um, we get rejected all the time. What do I know? Was it because I'm not most qualified or uh, because there was a faulty algorithm, right? And to uh, bring forward a lawsuit, you have to show harm. Um, and I don't have any evidence of harm. I mean, I've been rejected, but that's not enough evidence um, mm. of harm. I think the only thing we've seen is... Um, I Tutor Group, uh, which is a, I think, a Chinese-based company that hired English-speaking tutors in the United States and maybe other English-speaking countries, and a applicant s- uh, sent their resume in, and she got rejected. And what she was like, "This is weird. I thought I was, you know, like um, uh, well qualified." And then she sent in different resumes with different ages, and found out that women over fifty-five were automatically rejected. Women under fifty-five went through, and she brought a case to the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission in the U.S. And they had a settlement with the company, and I think the company has to change their way. So maybe that's one little lawsuit. Um, it never went to trial, um, but everyone is sort of waiting for these big lawsuits. But I think I know yeah. of some lawyers who try to build class action lawsuits, but they haven't been really successful because we know so little about these tools. Um, so I think this, um, uh, you know, the silence around these tools and how they're being used is actually really helping companies in that way that we haven't seen a lot of pushback. Yeah. Okay, well, very interesting. Well, the last question goes to Ken, um, uh, and I, let me again rephrase a bit. Maybe, maybe is um, um, the, I mean, we have seen a lot of new forms of work now coming up with the pandemic. You know, a lot of people uh, work from home, at least partly, and there's a kind of a proliferation of flexible working arrangement. Uh, how, what's your assessment? Does this actually worsen the situation with AI or help? Does it help us? You know, do, do people have more flexibility now to kind of also maybe circumvent some of these tools? Or what's your what's your view on this? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, some of these monitoring tools existed before the pandemic. And, you know, some of the one way video interviews clearly existed before the pandemic. But with the pandemic and people working at home, I think there were a lot of employers who started freaking out. Are my employees actually working in home office? Right. And there, we've seen a proliferation of a lot of these AI tools being used to monitor workers. And, you know, some of these companies reported like, oh, we have like a mil- thousand percent more uh, folks who are, who are using our services. So maybe it's being brought back a little bit now that we have like a little bit like three days in in in-house and and two days uh, at home but I think some of the problems that we often see is like once you have installed the technology it's really hard to to uh, take it off um, and uh, take it off because you already have it and it it produces signals that uh, that companies take into account so uh, I don't know if we see a lot of back walking and especially now I think we actually in the U.S. we see huge backlash for folks who work um uh, uh, the whole the whole work days at home. Um, that people have threatened layoffs to them, um, if they don't come back to the office. And we've actually seen a lot of pushback, um, to that. Okay, excellent. Thank you very much. Right on the hour. Uh, that was a great conversation. Thank you so much, Ilke, for for all your insights. Uh, uh-huh. um, if you, I don't know if you have a picture of your book or you want to put the link into the uh, the chat so that uh, folks can maybe check it out. Um, uh, and in any case, I think the book merits really a wide order, uh, readership. Um, very interesting, informative, and and obviously very scary. Okay, here. <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> Excellent. Yes. Um, so um, so so there's there there's a whole lot more examples in yeah. there. Um, and I'm happy. Uh, you know, if anyone wants to find me, I'm on LinkedIn. There's only one. I think there's only one Hilke Shellman on this whole earth. So you will find me. I also have a website, so you can contact me. I've sort of uh, I'm less and less on Twitter, as I think most people are, uh, with what's happening. So so uh, LinkedIn is uh, is probably a good way. I'm happy to uh, uh, answer any questions, um, try to help anyone. You know, I think uh, you know we need to have a counterforce, and I think uh, uh, labor organizations are are, uh, are one of the best bets that we have. So I'm happy to help. Um, not a labor organizer or a labor lawyer, but I think I have some expertise uh, what what is happening with these tools and maybe help people uh, build up capacity and, and help folks um, uh, try to figure out like, how can we make this a better world, right? Like I'm trying to say, I'm not against using AI tools per se. I'm just against them being used in a punitive way. I think actually sometimes I wish, you know, I'm a new parent. If I had like a parenting AI tool that would tell me, hey, don't raise your voice. Try this. Uh, but, you know, I don't want like Child Protective Services to listen to this and be like, whoa, what is this woman doing with her kid? Right. Like, I think there might be ways that this that some of the technology could be actually beneficial, but we need to know about it. And we don't even know about it. Right. And yeah, I think 
when companies use it, it's often used in a punitive way. Um, so I think we need to push back against that. And the companies right now have most of the power, not the individual workers. Absolutely. Well, we will definitely come back to you for more insights on this. So thank you so much, Hilke, for joining thank us and wish you all the best. Uh, thanks. Thank you. Bye-bye. Talk soon. Bye. Bye-bye.